The following podcast was recorded on Tuesday, April 27th, 2021, featuring Jim Bianco of Bianco Research and Ben Breitholtz of Arbor Data Science. To hear the podcast in real time, you can sign up for a free trial at biancoresearch.com or arborresearch.com or by emailing Gus Handler directly at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. You can also call Arbor Research and Trading at 1-800-606-1872. Thanks for your time and enjoy the podcast. Welcome everybody to our 50th edition of Talking Data. I'm Kristen Radish with Arbor Research and Trading. I'm here with Jim Bianco of Bianco Research and Ben Breitholtz of Arbor Data Science. Welcome to both of you. Today, Jim and Ben will be discussing the changing correlation between stocks and bonds. We'll also touch on inflation and real yields. Ben, we're gonna get started with you. The stock and bond correlation is changing for the positive. What does this mean? Right, so what's happening, and this is something I think that's been kind of under discussed as of late, is uh, the connection between the returns of treasuries and the returns of, of equities are suddenly becoming positive uh, over a more short term three to six month look back. And that's something that doesn't really, uh, hasn't really persisted for that long a period post really 2000. So we've seen kind of bouts of it over time. Um, and it's a question now of, what is going to be the driver and allow this correlation to potentially turn you know, more deeply uh, positive? Um, or if you think of it in terms of yields versus the S&P 500 turn you know, more appreciably negative. And what we've noticed really since the beginning of this year is a lot of the movement in yields, nominal yields has been driven really by this real yield component. And what that means is the Federal Reserve has been kind of in the driver's seat there uh, with you know, kind of fears of tapering and then ultimately rate hikes. We saw the Euro dollar curve price in over 100 basis points of potential tightening uh, not too long ago between now and December, 2023. And that's what kind of gave a lot of inertia to, to rising yields. But, and this is something Jim's been touching on too, has a great update uh, today, which would be yesterday when we released this, um, on the potential for inflation, all of a sudden there's this shift in the correlation between TIS break evens, inflation expectations, and nominal yields relative to the real yields to nominal yields. And what we're seeing is a chart here we've thrown up is that the correlation between inflation expectations, again, TIS break evens relative to nominal yields, has fallen off the map. That correlation has actually even turned negative at the short end of the curve. Historically, though, when we get to these kind of levels, this is an extreme. And if you get even more short, short term, these are three month rolling uh, correlations and look at like the past month, these correlations are starting to shoot higher really quickly, which means inflation expectations all of a sudden um, could be uh, in the driver's seat and really take the baton from the Federal Reserve policy expectations. And this is on the heels of some tremendous moves. I'm sure Jim can cover in lumber, grains, corn, soybeans, wheat, uh, polymers, all kinds of stuff. And this is even not just on a year over year basis. Yes, everyone's making fun of year over year charts. There's plenty of, of that to do. But even on a monthly or three month annualized basis, there's some pretty hefty moves occurring here that are fueling these inflation fears. Um, and so we got to see how that develops. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about the bigger picture of the stock bond relationship. Go back to say World War II and forward. It seems to move in big, long, secular trends. It's positive for 20 years, it's negative for 20 years, positive for 20 years, negative for 20 years. The correlation has been negative for the last 20 years, as Ben said, since around 2000. Negative correlation, Basically means stock and bond prices move opposite each other or stay the same thing. Yields and stocks move together. An outcome of that has been the whole wealth management business has oriented itself around the 60-40 portfolio. 60% equities, 40% bonds or some variation on that. Why? Because when the stock market goes up, you're 60% in equities and you get some upside. When the stock market stumbles, in a negative correlated environment, your 40% leg, your bond leg is supposed to rally and provide you some kind of a cushion. And that's worked great. That has worked great for 20 years. But if the stock bond relationship is gonna go positive, so stock and bond prices move up and down together or yields and stocks move opposite each other, your 60-40 portfolio becomes 100-0 is what it winds up being. Either both stocks and bonds are rallying and you're happy, or both are falling and you're not happy 
because you're losing more money than you expected to. Remember, if you're in a 60-40 portfolio, you're a little bit of a chicken. You don't want to be 100% in equities because you're afraid of the downside. But when it's 100-0 and both are falling, it's going to look like you're in equities on the downside, and you won't be uh, very, very happy with that type of uh, performance as well, too. So if this short-term move up in the positive of the correlations can persist, I think it has big ramifications for the wealth management business. It has big ramifications uh, for the institutional business. Um, you know, the risk parity trade has been all oriented around this idea that there's a relationship between stocks and bonds that we could kind of play stocks off of bonds with each other. But if that relationship is in the early stages of changing, a lot of what Wall Street does is going to have to be rethought. And I think the the investors in, are kind of hip to this. So I know there's a lot of um, you know, pundits, people out there that make fun of the death of the 60, 40 portfolio stories. Um, and I get that to a certain extent, but, um, you know, I'm in agreement with you, Jim. It, it, it does seem though, like investors are, um, you know, deep kind of taking away that added risk that could be there present within having two positively correlated assets. So the flows into treasuries have absolutely stopped and there's been kind of persistent outflows. Yes, we saw a little bit of uh, inflows over the past week or two, but investors have been shifting that focus away from uh, essentially treasuries and into things like uh, higher dividend equities and other spaces maybe within fixed income and not to governments. So as much as we want to talk about, oh, 60, 40, you know, um, you say it's going to die, it hasn't. But investors are somewhat shifting that profile. Um, and I, I think they're hit to that. And that's the transition, like Jim said, if we get this uh, persistent positive correlation, that's, that's really going to shift uh, quickly. So again, it comes down to the inflation prints here going forward. I agree. Uh, just a real quick comment about the flows. Uh, what's been a curious factor in looking at the flows into government bonds, and I'm talking about like the last five years, is there's been inflows and there's been decent inflows into them for the last several years. And people have scratched their head and go, there's no yield, there's no potential for return. Why would anybody buy these? Jeremy Siegel, Dr. Jeremy Siegel always used to say that. And I used to say, it's the 40% leg of a 60-40 portfolio. And as stocks rallied and you became 65-35 or 70-30, because your stock portfolio gets a bigger, bigger weighting, you were, you were um, uh, rebalancing out of stocks and in the bonds, which is why for the last several years, you saw stock, return, uh, stock flows were always negative or nearly negative. And bond flows were nearly positive. Well, as Ben pointed out, that seems to be changing in the last few months because investors, as Ben said, are hip to this idea. Well, you know, if the 60-40 thing ain't going to work, I don't want to keep doing it. And if, I, if it's 100-0, I might as well play all stocks because at least I get some real upside when it goes. Um, and so that's why you started to see this shift now from treasury flows towards equity flows. And next, could you touch on the role of inflation? How does it play into this? I'll, I'll start there. And those big secular shifts we were talking about when they're negatively correlated, positively correlated. Well, let's take positively correlated. When stock and bond prices went up together and down together, or yields and stocks moved opposite, same thing. That was the current state of affairs from the mid-60s to the late 90s or maybe around 2000. I refer to that as the inflation mindset period. What was driving everything was inflation. Now, you could have periods like the 80s when we're being driven by inflation, but thankfully there is none. So yields would fall and stocks would rise or both stock and bond prices would rally. Or you could have periods like the 70s when you were worried that inflation was returning and both stock and bond prices went down together uh, as well too. But the dominant mindset was inflation. 2020 or, or last year or, or current, that was a negative correlation. And I used to say the, the, the mindset there was deflation. Everybody was worried about deflation. In a deflationary environment, when you were worried that that was going to happen, yields would fall because there's not only no inflation, but there's negative inflation. And that was not perceived to be good for stocks. They would fall. When you were relieved, because most of that period, 
we were worried about deflation, but thankfully we didn't have it, yields would kind of creep a little bit higher and stock prices would go higher too. So if we're changing this relationship to positive, I think we're changing the mindset towards more inflation, like we did from the 60s to the 90s. And remember, to change the mindset doesn't mean, oh, well, stock and bond prices both have to go down. You could say, look, we're in an inflationary environment now, but we don't have any, so you can have a rally. But the minute you do have inflation, it wipes both of those out. The evidence of that when it comes to inflation is myriad all over the place. Companies are reporting their first quarter earnings right now. According to Bank of America, there's a 300% rise in the number of companies mentioning inflation versus previous quarters. And this is the largest quarter since 2004 when they started their study that they've seen mentions of inflation. Uh, you've seen booming commodity prices, whether it's industrial commodities, agricultural commodities, or lumber, which is up 50% just this month. It's up 50. Quick, build your house because it's getting more expensive by the hour right now if you're, if you're trying to build a house in terms of uh, lumber prices as well. You've seen it in tips break evens are at multi-year highs. You've seen it in the surveys of, invest, of uh, consumers. They expect more inflation. And what's really interesting is there's like one sector that you don't have inflationary fears, and that's energy because crude oil prices are not really anywhere near their all-time highs, and they've been languishing. They're up a little bit. They're not down, but they're languishing. They're not going parabolic like everything else is right now. So to me, that's a little more worrisome because when crude oil prices take off and drive inflation expectations, everybody can say, oh, that's a supply squeeze out of the Middle East or war tensions out of the Middle East that's causing that to happen. That's not real inflation. Okay, it's not about energy. It's about everything else which tends to look a little bit more inflationary. Yeah, and I think that's what's funny is energy and crude oil has become such a back, you know, it's become kind of an, an afterthought, even with all the tips commentary we get from all over the place. Um, it's it's kind of been, it's it become less important. But let me talk about the uh, realized and then also inflation expectations and kind of how this plays into this. One signal that things are pretty different, I think I mentioned this last last podcast, is that um, you flexible CPI, which is all the stuff that shoots all over the place, and that can be you know gas prices, it can be um, you know ele consumer electronics and all kinds of stuff. That flexible CPI does move around quickly, um, and it looks kind of random but noisy. That shot up almost 15% on a three-month annualized basis through through March. Um, but it's increasingly connected to sticky CPI, which is the important part, and that's going to be connected to things like the core PCE and core CPI. And its correlation, uh, looking at those three-month annualized changes uh, over the past three years, is the highest on record. And usually those aren't connected. You kind of oscillate around you know, 0 to 0 0.1 in terms of actual correlation. Now it's 0 0.65, which to me is, is interesting in that it means that the pandemic but potentially here with the shock on the flexible side, which is where we saw it first, is hitting the sticky and is going to potentially bring a sticky CPI, CPI up. You gotta remember after every calamity recession since 1980, sticky CPI and core CPI have done nothing but regime shift lower and then go sideways. That's how it's gone every time. Uh, but if we see this increased connection between flexible and sticky CPI and everything, everything's kind of going up, that means that regime shift down is not going to likely occur again. Um, and that brings up a new scenario that we really haven't seen since the 1980s where we could actually get a step higher, not a step lower, um, which would be uh, very consequential. The other thing is inflation expectations. This is where it gets kind of interesting. This is what kind of I think matters for investors is they're kind of right now on this fence. If you look at um, the options market, uh, looking at, at CPI, it's called inflation swap caps and floors, um, but at two and a half percent headline CPI year over year strikes, looking out two to 30 years, at the short term, they're pricing in about maybe a 55% probability that we can run at two and a half percent or above for the next two to five years. And they're just below like around 45% for the next 10 to 30 years. So right now they're on that fence. And I think that's also why we've seen tips break evens and they get to these multi multi year highs, but have kind of skated sideways uh, really since the end of March.
Um, they're trying to figure this out and wrestle this out. So it's a matter of, are they going to price in this right side tail, which could be a big deal uh, for pretty much anything and everything, uh, or is this just gonna kind of fizzle out? And this gets into the whole Fed debate, the dumb debate about transitory and um, temporary uh, influences here that can impact inflation, which the Fed is really glommed onto. And there's one chart we have that's uh, good at showing this, um, that shows, you know, historically when they've discussed transitory is during these shocks. It could be crude oil like 2015, could be uh, global synchronized growth in 2018, 2011 when we had an inflation scare too. Uh, we're right, right up against those levels. But uh, the, the Fed is committing to this passive approach. And we have another chart where we show the Fed is kind of really sitting on their hands and it's become incredibly results-based. So the amount of words that they're uttering, like wait, transient, patient, long way, sometime, which is like Clarita's and Brainerd's favorite, um, those have shot to the you know to record highs. And so they're really sitting on their hands and allow, allowing this to unfold without getting in its way, which again is another sign, just like the sticky and flexible CPI is coming together and correlating that this time is is pretty different. Well, Jim, can you wrap us up today by talking about real yields? <clears throat> yeah, um, just uh, feeding off of what Ben was just talking about, the Fed likes to use the phrase well anchored. And what they mean by that is it's really hard to raise prices. And there's no better example of that than P&G. Procter & Gamble had their earnings call last week, and they made an announcement that they're going to uh, raise prices in September and that they will have more information and more press releases between now and September about raising prices. It's not that hard to raise prices, just raise them. But now we have to go through this tortured month, months long process of raising prices. Prices are well anchored. Why are companies that way? Because in the past, when they've raised prices, is that the way I like to explain it is, you're on the second page of a Google search of lowest price to highest price and you lose all your market share. And it's always been a disaster for a company to raise its prices. But if we're at a breaking point now where they raise their prices and they don't lose market share and other people follow suit and raise their prices and everybody's talking about it, then we unanchor inflation. And that's the Fed's worst nightmare because the first thing I think happens when you unanchor inflation is those negative real yields that we've seen in the market go positive. They go right back up to positive. And that's a fancy way of saying that you're gonna get your, your nominal 10 year note yield, which is around 160 right now, over 2%. And it's going over 2% as you build back in these premiums back into real yields as well. And you'll have much, much higher um, inflation. And when you unanchor inflation, which means, hey, I can raise prices and make more money instead of, hey, I raise prices and lose market share and everybody does it. The Fed says that they've got tools to, that they could deal with it. And I've joked on this podcast, yeah, I've got a bone saw if you've got gangrene. And my point is, you don't wanna get there because once it's unanchored, yeah, you've got tools that you can get it back anchored, but boy, is it gonna be painful in order to get there. So the Fed, as Ben says, they'll, they'll tomorrow or, Today, when this comes out, uh, Jay Powell will have his um, uh, uh, press release and he'll mumble the words transitory and he'll say that inflation is a good thing because it expresses that the economy is getting better. And if that's true, it's OK. But if it's just this is the beginning of something more sustained, then we've got a real issue on our hands. Well, thank you both for all of your thoughts today and thank you everyone for joining us for any information. Further information on Arbor Data Science, Bianca Research, uh, please contact Gus Handler at gus.handler at arborresearch.com.